Good morning. Welcome to the Church of the Holy Trinity. It is a delight to be with you wherever you might be. We are going to invite you to join your voice with ours, and you'll find the words on the screen or in the Book of Common Prayer or in the bulletin online. That also has all the announcements, so it's not a bad place to go. But we're going to begin the way we always do with the moment of silent prayer, asking God to fill us now. Let's pray. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now we take a moment to confess our sins as a way of bringing our errors and mistakes to God who gives us his grace and forgives us. Together, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most, Most merciful God, God we, we confess, confess that we have sinned, sinned against you in thought, thought word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have we not loved, loved our neighbors, neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Our psalm today is Psalm 85, verses 8 through 13. You can find it in the Book of Common Prayer on page 709. We'll say it responsively by whole verse. I will begin. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying, for he is speaking peace to his faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to him. Truly, his salvation is very near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. 
Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness shall go before him, and peace shall be a pathway for his feet. Glory, Glory to, to the, the Father, Father, and to, to the, the Son, and to, to the, the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was, was in the beginning, beginning is, is now, now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. Our first reading is by Nancy Kaufman. It is from Ephesians chapter 1. A reading from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he has chosen us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavishes on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who worked out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possessions to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. And now for some special music. It's a song entitled, I Will Rise, sung by Kurt Butler with Loretta Love. Thank you. 
Our second reading is read by our deacon, John Long. It is from Mark chapter 6. A reading from the Gospel of Mark, the sixth chapter. King Herod heard of Jesus and his disciples, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and asked her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the baptizer. Baptists on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oath and for the guest, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Lord God, we ask for your presence in our lives and in our hearts and in our minds, that you might speak your word into us, that we might discover truth and be changed forever. Amen. Pretend with me for a moment that this is me. Let's just say that this is me. This is my identity. This is who I am. And so what I've already begun to do is write my name on it, right? Because that's one of the ways that we identify ourselves. This is clay. There's other things that I could be writing on here besides my name. We, we are more than just a name. For instance, I'm a priest, and I could write that on there. I am a dad, I could write that on there. I'm a, a son, I could write that on there. I'm a Nebraskan, that's a bit longer to write, but I got it, see, it all fits on there. I, I could keep on going. I'm an engineer by training, I am um, a friend, um, so I can write that on here as well. I mean, I could keep on going, and I could spend literally all day writing things on this box that capture the identity of clay. This would be me. And it's the same way for you. you. You could do the same thing, and your words might be different, but still, you would be able to write all those things on this box. But do you notice something really important? And that is that even if I had completely covered this thing with ink and words, the box itself doesn't change. The box itself is still... Well, just this box. Sure, I can improve myself. I can polish myself up. Sure, there's things that I could do, and, and those things are not bad. But what happens is that it doesn't really expand my box. 
In fact, what it's a reminder of is that I, as a human being, am finite, limited, a certain size. I have got a constraint of resources. I am insufficient to accomplish everything that I might want to accomplish. There's good stuff on there, but not everything. Not everything. Because I'm just a person like you. And that is a sometimes challenging thing for us to get our heads around about our identity. In fact, it's a little sobering and grim to realize just how limited we really are. We're not much more than this, which could actually kind of feel like bad news. But the good news is, is that in the scriptures, what we see is a completely different way of defining our identity. In fact, what we see in the scriptures is an alternative reality that is mind-boggling. And what we do is we find that in today's reading from Ephesians. We're kicking off a study of the book of Ephesians. And, and right here at the very beginning, what Paul does is he tries to change our understanding of who we are. And he does that right off the bat and he does that by using words. Now, in this passage, you heard it read, there are a lot of big words in there. But this new way of seeing our identity, it isn't in any of the big words. This is the part I love about the gospel. It's not in any of these long, fancy words. In fact, Paul changes our understanding of our identity with really two simple words. And those simple words are those, in Christ. See, what Paul does is he uses this phrase over and over again. In fact, in his epistles more than 90 times. In the book of Ephesians, 16 times. In just this passage, just these 13 verses, if we added not just in Christ but in him, there would be eight times where Paul would be referring to this reality of our world our personhood, and that is, he would say, in Christ. In fact, I underlined them all, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in him, in Christ, in him, in Christ, in him. Do you get Paul is actually telling us something really crucially important? And though the words might be small, the content is of significant importance. Because what Paul is trying to do is to say, there is a difference between you and I being this, clay lean, that's all you got. And what he begins to do is he says, there is a change that happens when Christ gets our hearts. There is a transformation that occurs, and that transformation is that somehow my identity now becomes in Christ. And when that happens, it's not just two nice words to put in a card or fill a letter. What he's describing is an ontological reality. A metaphysical alteration in who I am actually happens. Something is radically different now because I am in Christ. And you see, this is profoundly important good news. At least it is for me because you see, when I am in Christ, now suddenly I am not defined by my limitations. I'm somehow connected into the resources and the power and the strength of the divinity itself. I am no longer defined by my weaknesses and insufficiencies. I am not incapable or unable. I am not powerless or hopeless. Instead, what I am is I am new creation in Christ. And suddenly, all the things that are Jesus are me. Now, that's an important understanding. It's like when I am in Christ, literally in Christ, when God looks at me, he sees Christ. When I look in the mirror, what I see is Christ. And when we begin to see the reality of that, then our very definition of ourselves explodes out of that little tiny box. Because in Christ, we are limitless. But Paul wants us to understand that. And not just the concept of in Christ. What Paul wants us to know is what does that look like? In a sense, what words get written on your box now that you are in Christ? 
And that's what all the rest of these verses, the verses 3 through 13, those verses actually are one long run-on sentence. I mean, it's the longest run-on sentence in the whole Bible. And I think it's because what Paul does is he starts in on it and he gets so carried away with the radical transformation that this all means. And he just starts piling things on. And the things that he piles on are true in Christ and they are true for you. Suddenly, all of these are the words then that get written onto you. And let me just say, these things are profoundly different than any of the ones that I have written on my little box. Because what Paul does is he starts out and he says that you and I in Christ are blessed with all the spiritual blessings of the heavens, all of those blessings. And then he begins to list it. And if you are looking at the passage, you'll see what I'm talking about. He says that we are chosen, that literally God picked you by name. Personally, he chose you. And then he made you holy and blameless. And I know that's hard to believe because there are days I don't feel so holy or blameless, but that's not true. It's not the things I do that define my identity. It's who I am in Christ. And in Christ, we are holy, we are blameless, we are saints. And then it says that we are adopted as children of God, like we are in the family. We're not just servants, we're not just neighbors, we're not just kids down the street. I mean, literally, we're the ones who get to sit at the table of God because we are adopted as his children. And that means that we are beloved that we are so desperately loved. It's because we're his kids. And then he goes on and he says he redeems us and he forgives us. He takes all those places where we don't get so holy and blameless and he erases them from the slate. And he says they are made clean and that we are bought back from all of the wrongs that we have ever done. All of that happens in Christ. And then he gives us wisdom and insight and man, we need some of that all the time. And yet in Christ, we get that. And then we are inheritors. We are heirs, not just of a small fortune, but of the universe. We are destined to greatness, not because of something we do, but because of who we are in Christ. And that fills us with hope, not just hope that somehow we'll make it to the weekend, but hope that we know how it all ends and it will be okay. And it is true. And we can hope in that. And then it says that we are faithful, filled with God's faith, that he pours his Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, into us. And then literally God marks us as his own. He writes his name upon us because he never wants to lose us because we belong to him. All of these things, and this is just the beginning. All the rest of the scriptures, when you see over and over the descriptions about Jesus and what Christ is like, what we need to remember, those things are us. Not because I've got good genes or because I've got a seminary degree or because I'm particularly well behaved on Sundays. I mean, none of that. That's us because, remember, we are in Christ. It's an overwhelming thought to believe that these things are true of me. And that's the challenge. It really is the challenge, isn't it? I mean, God says these things are a fact, and then what happens is that you and I have got to figure out whether we will live into that. Because you know, in my head, I've got all kinds of things that I tell myself that define who I am. It's the mistakes that I have made along the way. It's the errors on my journey. It's the regrets that I have brought along. It's tapes that I play about how I'm not enough and how I'm insufficient and how I can't do it. And maybe you have those kinds of things too. And it's in those moments where those tapes and those words are beginning to echo that I need to come back to this. And I need to remind myself that I am in Christ. And in Christ, those things aren't true. They're just not true. They're lies. In Christ, this is who you are. And when you and I understand that, then what happens is, is that we literally can go out into the world and be that. 
Not because it's some set of rules that we're hoping we might measure up to somehow be acceptable. No, because this is who we are. Go out there and live like who you are meant to be. And it is a pretty impressive list. Your box all by itself is pretty small. Probably bigger than my box because you might be twice the person I am, but it's still really small. And so today, my encouragement to you, and in fact every day, is to remember that that box that we have belongs right here in the box in Christ. And then, see the world change forever. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for what you have done in us. Thank you for a new identity, a new creation, a broader, richer, fuller version of clay that is in Christ. I pray for me, and I pray for every single person in this congregation, everyone listening, in fact, all over the world, that somehow we would begin to glimpse that. And then we would begin to live it. Amen. Amen. Let's confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. It's on page 96 in the Book of Common Prayer or here on the screen together. Let us say, I believe, believe in, in God, God, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the prayers. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And we continue with the prayers of the people. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy. For we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, we hope. And we shall never hope in vain. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit that in all the cares and occupations of our life we may not forget you, but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O oh God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your Spirit upon all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let's take a time for personal prayers, whatever concerns or thankfulness uh, may be on your heart today. Lord, we uh, lift up to you the people of Haiti, 
be with them in this time of trouble and through the power of your Holy Spirit may calm and peace be brought forth. Father, we thank you for the life, the new birth of Elliot Michael. We pray for those who are sick and need your healing touch. For Joe Mack, for Mary, for Anne. We pray for everyone who's traveling this summer. Give them safe passage, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your deliverance through this pandemic and we ask that in those places around the world where it continues to surge, that you would protect and provide and that you would continue, Lord, to keep our numbers down. We thank you for a very successful vacation Bible school for each kid, youth and adult who attended. Lord Jesus, your grace is truly limitless. You are at work in our lives in ways that we see and sometimes in ways that we do not. And yet, our hope in you, our trust in you, allows us to see and to feel and to experience your grace. And in reply, say thank you and so thank you for hearing our prayers and for loving us in christ amen, amen. we continue with the prayer of saint christostom we'll say it together almighty, almighty god, god you, you have given, given us grace at this time with one accord to make our, our common, common supplication, supplication to you and you, you have promised through your well-beloved son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A couple announcements before the blessing. Um, you might have seen last Sunday's recorded service, and in there you would have seen some of the images of Vacation Bible School. If you haven't, if you missed that, <clears throat> then I would encourage you to do take a look at that. We had an awesome Vacation Bible School here and there were so many children and adults and youth that came and got to participate in that experience and a lot of that thanks to you and the people of this church who support it <coughs> so um <coughs> sorry about that um the flowers that we have today for the altar are in thanksgiving for the blessing of 10 years cancer free for sue everett and that's given by sue and Alan Everett. Thank you, Lord, for 10 years. And finally, the blessing. May the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.